<laughs> Yo, what is up Knights, Aegis Rick here, and in light of the recent release of the game on Steam, I feel it's an appropriate time to make a video like this one. The game has actually been out for more than a year now, and I feel like someone who's been here from the start would be very qualified to fill you in. If you're new to the game, or just want to know more about it, well, take a seat. I'm gonna be covering all the main topics of the game you're probably dying to get answers to, such as, what is this game about? How's the management? Is this game pay to win? How's the PvP? How's the end game? And finally, what is this dreaded FP system? At the end of the day, is this an MMO worth playing and investing your time into? Well, I'll let you be the judge. So without further ado, let's go. Throughout the video, I'll be showing clips of the game, and I think you'll very quickly understand what this game is all about. In short, this is a free-to-play, 2D, side-scrolling, hack-and-slash game, similar to old arcade beat-em-up classics such as Streets of Rage, Double Dragon, and Golden Axe back in the day. Though comparing it to those old gems is a tad unfair, and really the largest similarity between them is the sprite graphic aesthetic, which for some people is extremely charming and pretty nostalgic as well. Everything else in terms of game Gameplay, however, has been revamped and supercharged to the nth degree. I'm talking the pace, the combo-based combat, the in-depth gearing system, and the massive number of skills. It keeps the gameplay fresh even for someone who's put so much time into it already. This game has some 42 unique classes to choose from, and none of them play similar to each other. Basically meaning that there will be a class for you. Introducing a psychopathic murderer, a supercharged street fighter, Hajime no Ippo, a complete and utter disgrace, Human garbage. a straight up demon, you thought this was night, but it was I, Pony, what, you get the idea right, you've got a lot to explore and experience with, and if you're an altaholic, it can give you endless enjoyment right there, for a game that's been out for 10 years in Korea, it really shows, and even to this day, new characters are getting released, and the old ones are still getting revamped. So now that you kind of get what this game is all about, let's talk about this game's management outside of the game. And with that, we need to discuss a little history. As previously mentioned, this game is more than 10 years old in Korea, and it's seen one short-lived release by the publishers Nexon of America back in 2010. However, due to the infamous, atrocious management of Nexon of America, the game died in 2013. But in 2014, the actual developers of the game, Neopold, decided that they could host a global server themselves instead of dealing with a publisher and they have ever since March of 2015. And as of this day, we are only maybe four or five months behind the most updated version of the game in Korea in terms of content. For reference, alongside DFO Global, the version that you're probably playing, there are three other versions, namely Ered Senki in Japan, Chinese Dungeon and Fighter, and Korean Dungeon and Fighter. Now I mention all of that because it paints a picture as to the landscape for regular players like us. When something goes awry in the coding, we aren't submitting bugs to some publishers and then waiting indefinitely to get them fixed like most MMOs. Instead, we direct our complaints right to the guys writing the code. Because of this, bugs, complaints, and suggestions actually get put into practice and at rapid pace. Your feedback actually matters, as I've seen them make many decisions based solely on what the community was saying, such as adjusting their release schedule of content, or releasing events to mitigate any problems we've been having. That being said, they are developers and understaffed at that for the global department. So things such as an effective public relations, a centralized forum, and a 24-7 support are not their strong suit. I've sent a few tickets, however, and they seem to get back to you within the day, which actually is pretty phenomenal compared to some other publishers I've dealt with. Neopole has been shown to keep an updated Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and have also been known to read posts on other third-party sites such as those made on the DFO subreddit and DFO Nexus, two places of which I suggest for you newbies to check out by the way if you want to keep up to date on anything related to the game. Neopol also holds a live stream every two weeks to coincide with their update schedule, which yes by the way this game gets new stuff every two weeks, whether it be new events or new content, it's always fresh. You can check out my video recap series of updates here to see all of the stuff that we've gotten thus far in chronological order. So a question people always ask whenever it comes to free to play games is, is this game pay to win? The concept is pretty vague and usually subjective to what you think pay to win actually means. So instead of answering what I feel, I'll tell you all about our premium currency, Sera. 100 Sera is equivalent to one US dollar. You cannot trade this currency to other players. And for the most part, all of the items in the cash shop are bound to account. 
meaning you can't trade those either. In the case of avatars, which is our version of cosmetic costumes, they do indeed give stats, making costumes an important part of your gear. Other items that could give you a competitive edge over someone who never cash show up in the form of premium services. Neo Premium Contract gives you all kinds of goodies such as extra FP to play longer and more dungeon rewards. All of these contracts can help you level faster and allow you to level skills and wear gear earlier than you normally could. These inventory expansions can make you hold more items, and the same thing with the safe expansions. Expansions. More or less, the rest of the Sarah items are harmless cosmetics or unnecessary convenience items such as a dual skill build license. Now I'm sure you're thinking right now, well shit, if I can get all these things in the Sarah shop but I can't just buy them from other players, looks like it's pay to win, right? Well, wrong. You see, I mentioned all of this because while it certainly is possible to buy all these conveniences, just playing the game regularly can get you all of them as well. If you don't believe me, again, take a look at all of my update videos. As previously mentioned, there are a plethora of changes that come every two weeks, and with them a bunch of events that give these items away literally like candy, just for participating. For instance, I have never cashed for any of these contracts, and just take a look at how many days I still have remaining on them. There is also one notable item that you can purchase and trade to other players, and those are limited edition packages. You've seen them on the Steam sale as direct purchase, but we've gotten all of these at some time in the past with a bunch of extra goodies in them including avatars and clones, pets, titles, and the aforementioned inventory and safe expansions, and those you can purchase from other players with gold. All this to say, it's certainly possible as a free-to-play player to get all the kinds of perks a paying player can get without having to cash, and you are indeed rewarded for participating and playing the game every day. The most frustrating pay to win aspect may come in the form of Lost Treasures, or this game's version of a gachapon gambling system. However, this game drops the items necessary to open them pretty regularly in all optimal level dungeons, so amassing a collection of them for a free to play user is extremely common as well. I would go so far as to say that buying them almost seems like a waste of money if you're just playing the game regularly. Overall, do I think these things make this game pay to win? Not at all. This is a pretty standard model for free to play games to follow, and because it's not necessary to cash to get any cash shop items like some other games, I really can't complain. But then again, you can debate all you want about that, because all I've done is lay the facts out of the matter. Alrighty, here's a segment for you PvP buffs out there. Now, I'll say this game's primary focus is its PvE. However, that's not to say the PvP in this game is just tacked on. No, in fact, there are huge PvP tournaments over in Korea, similar to what you see here in League of Legends in the West. It's a big esports kind of thing that I truly wish was more popular here. If you want to see North America's first debut in a yearly event called Fighting One, you can check my recap of the events here. It's pretty exciting, hopefully we'll do better this year though. Anyway, PvP is more or less balanced around level 50 and below skills, all of which function differently depending on the different modes. They may do less damage or less potent to balance. Now there are a lot of things to consider about matchups and such, but the general gist is combos. Tons and tons of combos. Almost every class can do them, and once you initiate, it's up to you to combo them in such a way that they cannot escape. This can be done all the way up until your damage hits a literal cap, to which the game makes it impossible to continue comboing much further, and thus giving the victim a time to recover. Generally, three or so combos determine a match, given that you don't drop them, and needless to say, the matches can get pretty exciting. That's not to say that there aren't any complaints with it, however. There are a few aspects, namely the misstat, which is completely random in an otherwise skill-based PvP system. Missing drops the combo and in most cases gives the opponent an unearned opportunity to punish you for it. There are also luck-based status effects such as freeze or stun, which may or may not work in your favor, and is not entirely controllable. There is gear balance in the sense that all your gear provides the same stats, however there is a significant difference in stat values depending on gear level and grade. I don't have nearly as many videos to demonstrate this game's PvP, but I have a few, so go check them out at your leisure, of course, with live commentary by yours truly. One thing that you might be wondering about is the end game. Throughout the game, you'll be breezing through levels doing scenarios and basic quests. In fact, if I was going to look at it critically, leveling up is maybe a fraction of the time that you'll actually be spending in DFO. The game as it is currently is almost hypercharging your character into the end game of level 86. So if you're worried about leveling, you can get there in a few dedicated weeks of play, no problem. Even with the FP system that a lot of people seem to abhor. We'll talk about that in a second though. That means that the meat and potatoes of the game is all about the end game gearing and min-maxing that gear. The goal 
goal is to complete some kind of set gear. Like in most games, they come in different rarities, and I won't bother explaining all of that, but a general overview can suffice. You can farm Halidom equipment, which is the easiest, and just requires that you do more scenarios. You can do Otherverse dungeons as a daily to get coveted Chronicle sets, which boost your specific class's skills in a large way. Each class has about six sets, and they can often change the animations, cooldowns, and damage of a ton of your skills. You can farm quest legendary grade items, which again are much harder ordeal than Halidom's, but just require that you do harder dungeons. And finally, the penultimate class of gear is Epics, which you can only get by having pieces drop from Hell Mode, an exclusive event that occurs randomly in party, or is invoked on purpose with very expensive items called Demon Invites, which are slowly gathered by doing late game dungeons or the vast amount of events that we've been given. Using this gear, you'll be doing some extra content like Dark Elf Ruins, which just released, Mount Cullen, and Anton, Tower of the Dead, all of this stuff to min-max your gear and get different sets. It's very overwhelming, so an overview video can't explain it all, but suffice to say you've got a lot of options, and it's actually quite interesting to see how far my characters have progressed since the game came out to where they are now, even if they've all been maxed for a very long time. Now, I thought I should add this section because I can already see it as a main complaint towards a game like this. DFO is an instance-based game, meaning that you do dungeons in instances with a max party of four people. Each room that you enter costs one FP, or fatigue point, and you get standardly 156 FP every day. If you run out of FP, you are no longer able to enter normal dungeons. However, there are ways to fill it back up if you truly want to. There are FP pots which can recover a portion of it that you can craft with alchemy me, or that you can buy from a helpful shop requiring a currency called mileage. But aside from that, you'll need to wait until tomorrow to do any more regular dungeons on that character again. However, especially for you newer players, you're going to feel as though fatigue points are extremely limiting to your play. This is because you're doing extremely easy dungeons which burn through your FP very quickly and give the impression that that's how it's going to be forever. Take it from a veteran player though, it's not. Dungeons will get harder and longer, and therefore it'll take you longer to use your entire FP bar consistently every day. The true solution to FP is to create other characters, because each character has its own independent FP bar. In all honesty, if you make two or three characters and play them all in earnest, that should last you for the entire day if need be. I stream the game live for very long stretches of time, and three or four characters going full speed, non-stop can last me more than seven hours of gameplay. Now we can rave and argue about the FP system and how shitty you probably think it is, but one thing is certain, it's not going away as stated at the very start of this game's life. It's much easier to prepare against it by making more characters or amassing a lot of FP pots than it is trying to get FP removed. Well guys, to answer the question of is DFO worth playing, asking someone like me, a guy who's nearing max level on like almost every character in this game, if he thinks this game is worth playing is pretty asinine. I've played the game almost every day since it came out, and if anything, that in itself speaks volumes in that it's been enough to keep me busy for that long in terms of events and varying content, all the while never giving me enough of a reason to quit. Yes, the game is worth playing for me, but that's all for you to decide if it's worth it for you. But anyway guys, thanks for watching. I hope this video was helpful and informative towards your burning questions. Make sure you subscribe to the Aegis Rig channel if you want some more DFO content, if you're not convinced, or if you are convinced and you want to see more DFO content, since I'm so focused on that now. And that's all I got for today, so anyway guys, thanks for watching, and I will catch you knights <laughs> later.